For tonight, we're going to zoom out and talk about the moral life in Christ in general. And so we'll kind of leave it to you to apply all the principles into our present day, into the particulars. So tonight we'll use St. Antoninus as our sort of patron for the evening, the great Archbishop of Florence. He was a moral theologian and himself no stranger to public life. So I want to begin with a sort of thought experiment. Uh, and it's one I came upon several years ago, but I think it's, it's very interesting. And I ask you just to suspend your judgment for a little while. It'll all connect in a second. <clears throat> this is a disquieting suggestion. Imagine that the natural sciences were to suffer the effects of a catastrophe. A series of environmental disasters are blamed by the general public on scientists. Widespread riots occur. Laboratories are burnt down. Physicists are hung. Books and instruments are destroyed. Finally, a know-nothing political movement takes power and successfully abolishes science teaching in schools and universities, imprisoning and even executing the remaining scientists. Later still, there is a reaction against this destructive movement, and enlightened people seek to revive science, although they have largely forgotten what it was. But all that they possess are fragments, a knowledge of experiments detached from any knowledge of theoretical context, Parts of theories unrelated either to other bits and pieces of theories. Nonetheless, all these fragments are re-embodied in a set of practices which go under the revived names of physics, chemistry, and biology. Adults argue with each other about the respective merits of relativity theory, evolutionary theory, although they possess only a very partial knowledge of each. Children learn by heart the surviving portions of the periodic table and recite as incantations some of the geometrical theorems of Euclid. Nobody, almost nobody, realizes that what they are doing is not natural science in any proper sense at all. This comes from a book by a philosopher by the name of Alistair McIntyre, who teaches at Notre Dame, and he uses this as a sort of image what we're talking about just in this little thought experiment is the natural sciences. But he uses this as an image to show what's happened to our understanding of ethics and of the moral life. He continues, What is the point of constructing this imaginary world inhabited by fictitious pseudo-scientists? Uh, the, the hypothesis which I wish to advance is that the actual world which we inhabit in the actual world which we inhabit, the language of morality is in the state of grave disorder, and as grave of disorder as the natural sciences in the imaginary world I just described. What we possess, if this is true, are the fragments of a conceptual scheme, parts of which now lock these contexts from which their significance is derived. And he sort of goes along basically saying that now our understanding of the moral life is fragmented, and we use the words uh, we use moral uh, and ethical language, but it doesn't go together. We've, we've lost the, the overarching knowledge that we may have had. Now, this is kind of a, a sort of pessimistic evaluation of, of where we're at now in our modern culture, but I think there's a lot of truth to it. And um, because the way we see, we use moral words like moral obligation, duty, right, freedom, justice, and conscience, all these sorts of things. Um, but not everyone pays attention to the way in which they're used. And I think sometimes we use them inconsistently. So there's a poverty in our language. And it's one that's sort of crept in over the centuries, sort of like a, a frog boiling in the pot, not knowing he's, he's about to die. <laughs> um, so I just want to show that is sort of by way of introduction. Because we're now in a time of moral crisis. So there's not just widespread sin at a cultural level, but no longer even a recognition of sin, oftentimes. It's as if people don't describe that they sin anymore or do evil, they just make poor choices. Uh, and you know better than I have how much, for example, entertainment has changed over the years, um, and what children are viewing at a younger age, and our culture has become desensitized to in general. It's almost, I heard, um, one Catholic man uh, last week told me, you know, it's hard to find anything for me even to watch with my wife anymore, you know, in terms of a movie or television show. 
So I don't want to descend into any particulars because that'll turn into a ring. But I just want to kind of put that out there as in terms of where we're at. So even just with regard to attacks on marriage and family, we can say, um, you know, it's, it's, it's right there at the heart of marriage and family. To say that marriage is between one man and one woman and lasts for life is now laughed at um, or viewed as somehow intolerant. So what's happened? Well, I have the sublime privilege of setting up all the problems in this talk and leaving Brother Joachim to come to the rescue and save our moral life. Um, so I'm just going just gonna to put out as many as I can. Um, I think, and I want to do this to sort of connect to all the lectures we've had so far, because I think it does connect. I think it's safe to say that morality has been separated from an understanding of the purpose of life, the meaning of life. So that will go back to our first talk on the meaning of life. And this goes along with the notion that um, there's no meaning in life, so we've got to make up our own individual meaning. And that we can't know anything about what it means to live a good life and, um, by reason. Okay, so that's one. Morality divorced from purpose. It's also divorced from a proper understanding of human nature. And that, this relates to our second lecture when we talked about uh, dualism, the error of dualism that St. Dominic fought against. And I think the sort of modern problem is to, to think of ourselves as be, not being any different from the animals, not having a soul. We're just material. <coughs> and so we're determined to act in a certain way. And so we get off the hook because we're just like the animals. We act by instinct. There's a lot of people who think like this, think this way. <laughs> well, not think like animals, but who think we think like animals. But man is free, and his freedom is always directed towards good, towards God, because he's made, been made in the image and likeness of God. Also, morality's been divorced from human reason, and this would fit with the lecture we just had when we talked about faith and reason. If we say that reason just equals the natural sciences, as, as a number of uh, folks will assert, that means that we can't say anything about what it means to live a good life, what it means to do something good or do something evil, because you can't experiment on those, because we cannot measure the moral quality of an action with a microscope, it can't be known. So this is something that's out there, but, you know, rather we know, we can say something intelligent about the way we act as human beings. We can say when something's wrong, something's morally wrong. And this becomes a complete and full picture with faith. And we already have a sort of foundation in reason. Okay, so all these problems build on another, uh, and they're all related. Another important thing is that we've uh, lost a notion of virtue, and Brother Joe is going to talk about uh, virtue and how that will help us recover um, a notion of morality. We've also focused too much on duties and obligations sometimes, and we've often done this to ourselves. So if we view our relationship with God just as a matter of observing rules rather than an intimate sharing in his life, then who would want to be Christian if it's just rules? And often people will come to us and say, why do you follow those rules? How do you follow those rules? It's just about rules. All the church wants us to do is live up to these rules that are impossible. There's also this notion creeping around, and I'm sure you've talked to people who think this way, that there is no absolute, there is no absolute truth just a number of conflicting opinions. And so, uh, lying is good for you, but bad for me. Stealing is bad for you, but good for me. The murdering of an innocent life is good as long as X, Y, and Z is observed. Okay, so that's a number of the problems. And I think another interesting issue, and the one we're really going to approach tonight, is the notion of conscience, because we hear that word used a lot. But we want to think a little bit more um, precisely about what we mean when we, when we talk about the conscience. Okay, and before I turn it over to Brother Joachim, I just want to suggest one key. And that's that we don't feel forced to respond to people at merely the level they introduce a question. So when someone says, why does the church teach this teaching, yada, 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 this particular thing, we should be we should be ready to give them the full picture. Um, because if they kind of pin us in a corner, tell me about this teaching, make sense of this teaching, it seems so tough. Well, we ought to tell them about Jesus, ultimately, and, and to how it all relates. 
And we see in the gospel, Jesus himself, particularly when confronted um, about the teaching on marriage, doesn't respond immediately at the level when the Pharisees say, well, Moses allowed a man to divorce his wife for any reason. Um, and he said, well, in the beginning it was not so. He doesn't answer merely that question. He brings it back to the beginning. So I think we can do something similar, especially when someone gives us a moral question. Well, let's talk about what it means to be a moral person in general, you know, to bring it back to the big picture. And so with all those problems in mind, I look forward uh, even greater than you do to seeing Brother Joachim's <laughs> answer. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Brother Raymond. Um, I think to begin answering uh, these problems that Brother Raymond brought up, uh, we should start with a, a definition of morality. Uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia defines it as human conduct insofar as it is freely subordinated to the ideal of what is right and fitting. Uh, so in other words, it's, it's our conduct, our human actions, uh, as it's ordered to principles of right and wrong. Um, these, these principles, though, are grounded in our human nature. Uh, they're no, so, so they're knowable by reason because of that. Um, they're drawn from what is good for us, what promotes our well-being and our flourishing. Um, and so that's how they're grounded there. Um, so so, when so to make something right, and, right or wrong, it depends on whether or not it's good for us. Uh, so we can ask, what, well, what is good for us? Uh, our good consists in our perfection, the fulfillment of our purpose or goal. So there's the first of Brother Raymond's uh, problems is what our purpose or goal in life is. Uh, and he brought up the first lecture of St. Peter Martyr. Um, we said that our goal is to be with God, uh, to behold Him in the beatific vision. Uh, we can ask, well, why is that our goal? Uh, well, the simple answer is, because that's why God, that's, how God made us. Uh, the Catechism says that He made us in order to share in His divine life and His love. He wanted to show forth His goodness, so He created uh, man and the universe in order to do that. Um, I think here of a, a, a lecture that I heard from Father Robert Barron, um, who's got a, a, an organization called, uh, I think it's Word on Fire Ministries. Um, and he began a lecture on the moral life with a statement, God does not need man. Um, so that's, this is a key element of, of the thing, is that God created us in complete freedom. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need the worship that we give Him. He doesn't need the love that we give Him. Because He is uh, perfectly, he is a, He's the supreme being. He's perfectly contained in Himself. He's infinite love. Uh, so He doesn't necessarily gain anything. He wouldn't be lacking in any way if he didn't have the worship and the love that we give him. So, in looking at this, we see that we're, that he created us in complete freedom and invites us to a completely free response to him. So we, we shouldn't focus on um, what we have to do for God. We should instead look at freedom and, um, and the fact that by freely loving him, we're brought to the fullness of what we're meant to be. Um, so secondly, uh, is it reasonable to believe this? Brother Raymond uh, brought up this, uh, the point of, of reason, and, and we talked in last week's lecture uh, on St. Albert the Great, on uh, faith, uh, faith and science, or faith and reason. Um, we said that uh, reason alone can know a lot of things about the natural world can give us a lot of answers to things, but it can't um, answer the deeper questions in life, uh, what we call metaphysical questions, about why things are as they are, um, or what, what our purpose in life is. Um, so that comes to us through revelation. Uh, it, it's um, revealed by Jesus Christ. And um, so we can look, go back just a minute to, to why it's reasonable for us to believe uh, that our perfection consists in getting to heaven and living with God. Um, this is kind of it's grounded in, in human nature. And uh, Saint Thomas says that um, well, we know about we know that uh, we have an intellect and a free will. And Saint Thomas teaches us that um, our intellect is what judges something to be good, 
And when the intellect judges something to be good, uh, the will just naturally desires it. It's moved to desire what seems good. Uh, and when we attain this good, our will is satisfied. It's at, it's at rest. It doesn't want anything else, at least for the moment. And this is what we call happiness. Um, so, so the will uh, follows the intellect. Whatever the intellect judges to be good, the will desires. And we, we know just by observation that uh, our will desires infinite happiness. That there's created things that will for a time satisfy its desires. But, but ultimately it keeps wanting more. Um, Brother Raymond used uh, an example in our first talk uh, of uh, a dump truck that we received full of $100 bills. Uh, you know, we might be really excited and happy thinking about all the things we're going to do with it, uh, but ultimately that dump truck of $100 bills is going gonna, is gonna to run out and we're going to be asking, well, where can we get some more? Um, so by reason, we know that we have uh, an infinite desire and, uh, and faith tells us where that infinite desire can be filled. Uh, and that's by living in, in communion with God, who is an infinite, uh, whose infinite love itself is the supreme being. Um, and another thing to add to this is that um, friendship is quite is is the is the greatest joy that we can have in life. This was talked about a lot by the ancient Greeks um, about the joy of having having friends. Uh, and God, since He is the is, is infinite love itself, our friendship with Him is going to be the greatest sort of friendship we can have. Um, okay, so we've said what we can know by reason, that we desire the infinite, and we can also judge um, certain actions, whether or not they contribute to our good, just on a natural level. And we know by revelation uh, that our loving communion with God is our ultimate good. Uh, and as we said, Christ is the one that reveals this to us. He came uh, to save us, and he makes uh, our, our communion with God possible again by, by his grace. Um, and so Father Garigou, Reginald Garigou Lagrange, who we've talked about before, a French Dominican, uh, sums this up as saying uh, in that, says that um, says that our moral goodness is, or something is morally good insofar as it remain, as it relates to man's last end, uh, which is God, and it's morally evil insofar as it leads us away from God. Um, so we can say that the, the foundation of morality is, is virtue. And virtue, simply defined, is a habitual disposition to do the good. So it's our, our training of ourselves um, to, to, to pursue the good. And we all can realize, we all know that we desire to be happy. And the good, when we attain the good, we are happy. Um, and the, the Christian moral life is summed up in the eight, eight Beatitudes. Um, the Catechism of the Church says that the eight Beatitudes depict the countenance of Jesus Christ and portray his charity. They express the vocation of the faithful associated with the, glor the glory of his passion and resurrection. Uh, they shed light on the actions and attitudes characteristic of the Christian life. They are the paradoxical promises that sustain hope in the midst of tribulations. They proclaim the blessings and rewards already secured, however dimly, for Christ's disciples. So the Beatitudes sum up the moral life because they point to the attitude, they point to Christ himself. Um, they help us to recognize that we all desire infinite happiness and that God is the fulfillment of this. Uh, for example, just, just think about it for a minute. Um, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, you know, we, we all, it's pretty natural to man to want, to mu want money, to, you know, to, to buy things, to fulfill his desires. Uh, but the Beatitudes in this first one show us that it's when we're um, detached from money that we can, can look to God for our fulfillment. Um, okay, so we've summed up what the moral life is, it's in the Beatitudes. Uh, and we're going to take a look quickly at St. Antoninus, uh, who was um, a Florent, he was born in Florence, uh, was a Dominican saint. Um, and he's our model for a, a moral life, um, because as any saint, had, uh, hit, for him, God was the center of all that he did. So he recognized where his fulfillment lay, and, and he dedicated his life 
to that. Um, he wrote, he's also a particularly fitting saint for this topic because he wrote a, a summary of moral theology. Uh, it's called the Summa Moralis. Um, and not only did, well, he wrote this, and it was, um, he was the first one to kind of separate moral and dogmatic theology from each other. So the first one to, sign up to treat morality uh, as a distinct discipline. Um, so just to begin with our treatment of St. Antoninus, it, might, it would help to have um, uh, a picture of the historical situation at the time that he lived. Um, when he lived in Europe, the first, I guess, half of his life, or not quite half, uh, but the beginning of his life, there was uh, not any major heresies in Europe like that we talked about with St. Dominic, uh, but there was a lot of unrest, a lot of upheaval. Um, and there's several different reasons for this. The first uh, was what was known as what is known as the Great Schism in the Western Church. So there was uh, at one point three different men claiming to be pope, and this caused a lot of division, a lot of uh, conflict in the church. Uh, secondly, there was a lot of um, a lot of rebellions uh, throughout Europe because of the rise of the importance of economics and politics. Uh, so there's a lot of, I guess, um, lower class um, people that revolted in, in a couple of different countries um, because of, of, of economic oppression. Uh, and the third <coughs> thing that caused a lot of unrest was uh, the plague. It hit different spots in Europe um, throughout the 1300s and it, it caused a lot of hardship and suffering. Uh, so people um, were, were uh, I guess, tended more to, to rebellion when they were um, oppressed like that. Um, so St. Antoninus was born in the Italian city-state of Florence in 1389. Uh, he entered the Dominicans at age 15 in 1405. Um, he was characterized as a, uh, a quiet boy who was very pious, um, but also was very sickly, and that interrupted his study a lot. Uh, so he didn't have a lot of formal study, but he studied on his own, and he was known to have an excellent memory. Um, in fact, when he went to join the, the Dominicans, um, because of his sickliness, he was turned away, or the, the, the uh, prior that he went to didn't want to let him into the Dominicans. But he was persistent, and so the, uh, the prior, who's blessed, um, John, blessed John Dominic, was a reformer in the order, uh, told him that if he could memorize the Decretals of Gratian, which were, um, a, a, I guess, basically uh, a code of canon law, he said if he could memorize this whole book, uh, that he would let him in. So St. Antoninus went home and, and went at it, and uh, a year later came back to St. Uh, Blessed John Dominic, um, and was, uh, he went through a pretty rigorous quiz and uh, didn't have any, uh, any wrong answers, so he was, he was admitted to the Dominicans. Um, he, after he went through novitiate and the rest of his formation, um, he, he quickly became prior of different communities uh, and became vicar general of the Lombard congregation, which was a reformed congregation in Italy. Um, they were Dominicans, but they were uh, they had separate houses of, of uh, uh, renewed uh, faithfulness to the constitutions and the, and the spirit of Dominican life. Uh, so he quickly, his, his, uh, his qualities, his judgment um, were quickly recognized and he, would, he assumed many positions of leadership early on. Um, so he served in, in different cities but eventually wound up back in Florence um, and was prior for a while of the uh, famous Dominican convent of San Marco. You um, might have all heard of this, it was where uh, Blessed Fra Angelico lived and did his paintings. Um, and Fra Angelico and uh, St. Antoninus were, were very good friends. Um, and they got along really well. <clears throat> so he, uh, he was prior, from being prior here at uh, San Marco, um, in 1446, at the age of 56, he was appointed Archbishop of Florence by Pope Eugenius IV. Uh, he served 13 years as the Archbishop of Florence until he died in 1459. Um, he was widely loved and revered um, by all the people. I've got a, a description here. Um, I should say that most of this 
information on, on St. Antoninus came from a, a biography of him by the English Dominican B. Jarrett, uh, who lived or, or died in the 1930s. Um, so it's a very good, uh, very good biography if you ever come across it. It's a good read. Um, but B. Jarrett describes, um, from his research, describes St. Antoninus um, so that he was known for his outstanding prudence, his common sense, and his impartiality and judgment. Um, he people came. He was widely known to be uh, known for the counsel that he gave. So people, rich and poor alike, um, would often come to him. You know, they bring him any kind of matter, you know, big or small. Saint Antoninus always made time for him. Um, he also, because of his position as archbishop, had a lot of dealings with the government of the city of Florence uh, and with the the leader. Um, the leader there was uh, Cosimo de Medici. Um, so St. Antoninus developed a friendship with them, um, but also there was a lot of conflict between them. St. Cosimo was known as a, a tyrant. Um, he was a great patron of the arts, did a lot of um, good for the city of Florence uh, in regards to that. Uh, he was very generous to the Dominicans, uh, but he was, he was also known as a tyrant and could be kind of cruel to his opposition at points. Uh, so there's quite a few instances of conflict between the two of them. Um, he was also uh, known as a great counselor to the popes. Uh, so uh, that was another thing that, that occupied a lot of his time. Um, St. Antoninus described himself as being phlegmatic in temperament. Uh, he said that he was had an inclination to laziness and to negligence, um, but he obviously overcame this because the, some of the traits that he was known most for was his energy and zeal and the intensity of his labor. You know, he had his duties as archbishop, um, he was a counselor to, to Pope, to the, the ruler of the city, and to, you know, the common people. Um, he was also a reformer of religious life. He continued the reforms um, that he learned, that he entered into with uh, Blessed John Dominic. Uh, he also reformed the secular clergy, that is, the diocesan priests. Um, and he was known for his great care of the poor. Uh, and then lastly, he wrote this, his Summa Moralis, which is a four-volume work on uh, moral theology, and he, there's other things that he wrote too. Um, and lastly, what, what drove this um, intense life was his prayer. Uh, he, he, he was very devoted to his prayer. He often prayed, um, the, you know, in addition to the, to the bravery that was required of any priest, he would pray uh, the seven penitential psalms every day, uh, a couple times a week he prayed the entire office of the dead. Um, so with this, he was, um, he was greatly benefited by his, his memory, because he had all the Psalms memorized. Uh, and so that's how he was able to keep up this, this routine of prayer. Um, so now we've kind of got a, a little bit of picture of what St. Antoninus' life looked like. Uh, I want to return specifically to morality. Um, and look at two virtues that, that St. Antoninus exemplified. Because um, we said that, that virtue is the, um, is the, is the basis of the, the moral life. Uh, the first one that I want to talk about is justice, which can be um, simply explained as being, uh, uh, simply defined as giving to another what his due is. Uh, and we can speak, first of all, um, about what we owe our Creator, what we owe God. Uh, he created us, gave us all that we have, um, so there is, it is appropriate to speak of what we owe Him. Um, it's, you know, just think about what a child owes his parents for, for giving him life, for give, providing for him, raising him, uh, educating him. It's, uh, it's injustice that we owe, like a child would owe his parents obedience and respect. Uh, so, in the same way, we owe God obedience and respect and our love. Um, but having said this, we have to be careful that we don't reduce the Christian life to just what we owe God to, uh, to the performance of duties or religious observances. Um, so, this can come about when we um, overemphasize or just focus too strictly on like the commandments and uh, the other parts of the moral law. Uh, the commandments tell us what not to do, uh, tell us the minimum of what we cannot, cannot do in order to, to keep uh, focused on the good, but they don't explicitly tell us what we're made for. 
Um, so here it might be helpful just to quickly look at law and what law is. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas defines law as a regulation of reason for the common good imposed by the ruler of the community. Uh, so we, here in this definition, um, St. Law tells us it's something reasonable and it's oriented to the common good. So here again we see that good is, is the, the, the deeper basis of, of, things, um, of the moral life. Uh, laws are just a minimum sort of uh, keep us going from out of bounds, you might think of. Um, and there are different, three different types of law. The first is the eternal law, and St. Thomas defines this as the plan by which divine wisdom rules all creatures. Uh, so God created us to, in a certain way, he gave each of us a certain nature, uh, and eternal law is just um, what, what the divine plan is, the ordering of our, um, of our good, or the ordering of our natures so that, um, that we're perfected. Uh, and natural law is the second type of law that is a direct derivation of the eternal law. It's imprinted on our, um, on our intellect. Uh, and so we, have, we know by, by reason, by nature, that there are certain things we shouldn't do. You know, it's pretty common um, throughout you know, all of civilization that, uh, for example, the murder, the, in, the taking of innocent human life is wrong. Um, so it's just one example. You know, people can can ignore that, and you know, eventually, uh, can ignore that completely, so that you know they become uh, you know, common murderers. Uh, but that's it's something that's that's knowable by reason. And the third uh, type of law is what we call positive law, and this is just statutes. You know, it's what I guess probably the most common type of law that we think of. You know. Uh, just the, all the laws of the government, uh, obeying the speed limit, etc. Um, and there can be also there can be divine or human positive law. So examples of divine positive law would be uh, the Mosaic law in the Old Testament. Um, but there's also uh, in the New Testament we received uh, a new divine positive law that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so there's so there can be human and divine positive law. Um, but we know that that law is not should not be the, the complete focus of the moral life. Uh, Saint Paul points out in his letter to the Galatians uh, that the Old Test in the Old Testament the Mosaic law was given as a custodian because of original sin. Um, so men were by original sin they were separated from their life with God. Uh, they lost um, divine grace that is the sharing in the divine life. And they needed, um, they needed something explicit to, to help guide them. So God gave them the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law. Um, but St. Paul says that uh, we're not meant to be slaves to the law, but sons of God by adoption. Uh, and if we're sons, then we're heirs to the kingdom of heaven. Um, by baptism, we become brothers of Christ, and so sons of God the Father, um, again, by adoption. Um, when we're baptized into Christ, we receive His grace, and so that's a sharing in, in, in the divine life. Um, so, just quickly, we can we can say that under justice we owe God our love, but we should remember that we're free. Uh, and God doesn't force us to love Him, and again, uh, He doesn't uh, He doesn't need us. He doesn't lose anything. He's not less happy if we're not if we don't give Him uh, our love, but it's what is good for us, and it's what he created us for. Um, so I think this is particularly important today to talk about freedom, um, because it's freedom is a notion that is uh, not understood correctly. Um, people shrink from duty in a lot of instances today, and they seek, uh, what they think of freedom is what we would call license which is uh, the ability to do whatever you want without stopping to think about whether it's ultimately for your good, for your benefit. Um, St. Paul says uh, in, in that same letter to the Galatians, he says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So we should, should look at, um, at the moral life as um, a, a free choosing of what is good for us, 
not a um, you know not just arbitrary rules imposed on us by God or the church. Um, so all this being said, um, Saint Antoninus uh, was really known for uh, for the virtue of justice. He talked about it a lot, um, and really was known for addressing a lot of uh, issues of injustices in society. Um, but his his um, his emphasis on the virtue of justice was grounded on his belief in the dignity of, of each person. So he knew what man was created for, and so he. Uh, demanded that it be given to him. Um, <clears throat> just a few examples of this. Um, at that time, Florence had uh, a lot of, or had a, a, a certain type of democracy, uh, and he uh, had to intervene a few times and really emphasize that the elections be free and not, um, not sabotaged. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Cosimo de Medici was um, a bit of a tyrant and could bully his opponents. Um, and sort of break things a lot. Uh, Saint Antoninus inter intervened in that several times. Um, and secondly, he was known. He spent a large part of his uh, summa moralis in talking about economics and economic justice. Uh, he emphasized um, a li having a living wage paid to laborers, uh, but on the other hand, also made sure he he talked to, to the laborers about putting in an honest day's work. Uh, so he was very even-handed, and that's why a lot of people came to him for his advice and his counsel. Uh, and in his treatment of economics, he began by defining what a good thing. He began by defining a good thing, uh, and said that God is our highest good. So he said that riches, you know, the sort of the um, said riches are a means to an end. They're uh, they're a means to being able to live virtuously. It's when we have the necessities of life that we can, can focus on um, what our ultimate goal is instead of on the immediate day-to-day -day, uh, necessities. So it, it frees us in a way. Uh, just one quick story there. Uh, he, wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't stand for imposters. Uh, there's a story of two blind beggars uh, who had been out begging uh, and had, had accumulated quite a bit of money. Uh, so they continued to begging even though they had what they needed for the day. Um, and they were turned into St. Antoninus, and he rebuked them and took away most of their money to distribute to other uh, poor people. Um, but he left them enough for what they had, and then he continued throughout the rest of their lives to support them. You know, they were blind, so they, they couldn't work. Um, but he, he got on them for, for begging from people, telling people they needed money when they didn't actually need it right then. Um, so he was, again, very even-handed. Um, but just to move to the, to the second virtue of charity, um, and this was the, the true foundation of, of St. Antoninus' uh, his moral theology and his, and his own personal life. Uh, charity, the Catechism defines as the theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake and our neighbor as ourselves for the love of God. Uh, so charity is what orients us to our final good, to God. Um, and this is just basically, it's repeating what we said at the beginning, that, that we were all created uh, to be happy, to achieve infinite happiness, and that this is in God alone. Um, and charity is called the new law. Uh, it's the new commandment given by Christ. It says in, in the Gospel of John, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Uh, so this is, so love is, is the focus. Um, and St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. So love is the, is the focus uh, and not just fulfillment of arbitrary uh, rules and regulations. Um, he, he's, St. Paul continues that the commandments are summed up in this sentence. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no, does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Um, so if you're oriented to the good, uh, if you want the good of another person, you will love them and you won't do any wrong to them. So that's essentially, that's, what's, that's all that's needed in the moral life. If you love, you won't do any wrong to another person. Um, and St. Antoninus has a good quote. Uh, he really emphasized that, uh, that love was the basis of the moral life and of spiritual progress. Um, he says, 
before our spiritual foundation is laid, and before we can leave behind evil, and before we can do what is good, it is necessary that we inflame our souls in the love of God. This should be the whole foundation of our spiritual life. By the love of God, a man arrives at a holy paternal reverence toward him. In such a way, the soul enters into a loving fear, such that a man would rather die than ever offend him again. Through such a fear as this, a man departs from every evil and every sin. And having departed from evil, and recognizing such a grace that God has given him, and from what danger he has freed him, the fire of love always grows and brings him closer to God. This fire consumes him and burns away the evil root of every vice and every bad habit. Um, so you can see that he, start, he begins with love. He says, if we love, then we don't have to worry about what's right and wrong, because we'll be oriented to the good. If we're always choosing the good, then we're not going to do something that's wrong. Um, and just a few examples of St. Antoninus' charity. Um, he founded what became known as a society, uh, a society that became known as the Good Men of St. Martin. Uh, so there was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Cosmo Medici had a lot of, um, I guess, questionable practices. And he ended up uh, taxing some of his political opponents to the point that they were uh, impoverished. They lost, you know, these were wealthy people that had lost everything. Um, and it was largely due to their, uh, to their opposition to the, to, their, to the governor of the day. Uh, so St. Antoninus uh, was very concerned for these people, and he gathered together uh, different nobles in the city and put together a fund for them uh, to provide for their needs. He also founded uh, several orphanages uh, in the city of Florence, and he was known to, to help anybody that came to him, uh, anybody that needed money, uh, or food or clothing. Uh, he even turned the the grounds of his um, of his bishop's residence uh, into vegetable gardens to, to feed the, the, the poor of Florence. Um, and we have there's a, a um, B. Jarrett says in his book that Saint Antoninus's charity was rooted in faith and glowed with trustfulness and in the inherent goodness of redeemed humanity. Uh, so again, Saint Antoninus was able to be so charitable because of his orientation um, to God and his, and his belief in the goodness of each person. Um, so that's just quickly two uh, virtues that are very, uh, that St. Antoninus exemplifies in his living of the moral life. Uh, now I wanna to turn to what uh, Brother Raymond brought up, uh, the issue of conscience. Uh, what is conscience's place in all of this? Um, it's often talked about uh, today as a means of, of justifying whatever we want to do. Um, you know, my conscience tells me to do this, so I'd rather do it. Uh, the Catechism defines conscience, uh, says it's a judgment of reason, whereby the human person recognizes the moral quality of a concrete act that he is going to perform, is in the process of performing, or has already completed. Um, so it's just briefly, it's the judgment of reason that tells us to do good and avoid evil. Um, so it, it, it goes back to, to, uh, to the fact that we have an intellect and that there's a natural law um, and it's oriented to doing what is good and avoiding what is evil, what is harmful for us, what prevents, prevents our uh, flourishing. Um, and we all have a conscience, we all have a reason. St. Paul says in Romans, when the Gentiles who have not the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. And here he's talking about the Mosaic law. It says, they show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. So we all can know by reason that certain things are not good for us, and so we're bound, whether we're um, Christian or Catholic or not, you're, everybody's got a duty to follow, um, follow what, is, what is good for them and for other people. Um, the Catechism says, and this is uh, the quote that a lot of people take out of context today and take to an extreme. Uh, the Catechism says, Man must not be forced to act contrary to his conscience, nor must he be prevented from acting according, nor must he be prevented from acting according to his conscience, especially in religious matters. Um, so we all have a conscience, we all have a reason to uh, make a judgment about what is right and wrong. Um, 
but this doesn't mean that we just do whatever we want and say, well, my conscience told me to do it, so I'm off the hook. You can't blame me for anything. Uh, everybody's got to, um, everybody has to form his conscience well. Uh, and how do you form it? By uh, investigating matters, learning more about them, um, and especially by entrusting yourself to the authority of the church. Um, if we investigate things and we uh, accept the authority of the church, believe that it was founded by Christ, um, we can put our trust in its teachings, and that's what forms our consciences. Uh, you know, when you trust yourself to the church, you can accept what the church teaches, and that's the, the primary way of forming a good conscience. Um, but again, we also know by reason uh, what is right and wrong in certain matters. Um, so thinking, uh, so thinking that so what we're not so what this this quote that I gave you doesn't mean is that thinking something right uh, makes it right. Uh, truth isn't isn't subjective. It doesn't depend. It doesn't change according to each person's conscience. Um, uh, the Catechism says that somebody is culpable for an evil act even if their conscience tells them to do it, unless there is invincible ignorance or they are not in control of their reason. So anybody, whatever act you perform, uh, you're responsible for that, unless there was no way of knowing um, what was right or wrong. Uh, so for example, uh, some, of the, the, um, some of the more, I guess, positive laws of the church, uh, you know, somebody that's not Catholic, um, or somebody that's never heard of Christ before would have no way of knowing uh, what those laws are, so they wouldn't be held responsible for them. Um, and it's also possible to, to ignore uh, right reason and to kill your conscience. Uh, so if you kind of, so if somebody, say they want to um, do drugs or commit a murder, if they ignore their right <coughs> reason telling them not to do those things and they kill their conscience uh, so that later on it becomes easier to perform those acts again, they're not off the hook because of that, because uh, because everybody will be responsible uh, for what they for what they did, how they sought the truth. Um, so we have to follow. We can never do what our conscience tells us is wrong. If we're willing to commit, if we're willing to do something that we honestly believe is evil, uh, we'll be answerable for that. Um, but if, if that's not clear, perhaps a better way to look at it, um, or a better way to approach it, is from the aspect of the virtue of prudence. Um, it's a, an approach that Dominicans often prefer. Uh, so the Catholic Encyclopedia says that prudence simply is right reason applied to practice. Um, a fuller description would be, it's an intellectual habit enabling us to see in any given juncture of human affairs what is virtuous and what is not, and how to come at the one and avoid the other. Um, so simply, prudence is, uh, is the ability to see what is good and, uh, and virtuous, what is good, what promotes our flourishing, as we said at the beginning. Um, and so quickly, that was, that was just my treatment of conscience. Um, and St. Antoninus wrote his Summa Moralis uh, with, the, with, with the virtue of prudence in mind. He wanted to give us uh, not just a list of what we should do and what we shouldn't do, but he wrote it to give us uh, the principles of moral action um, in order to help us to live our lives well and to, to, fulfill, um, what, to fulfill our purpose in life. Uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, 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 the end of the conscience. Um, that's our treatment of the moral life. But just quickly, I want to look at um, that's so. So those that's the basic framework of the moral life. But how would you go about um, actually judging whether something is morally right or morally wrong? Well, there's three things you have to look at, and I'm going to use um, an example from Saint Antoninus, uh, uh, the example of usury. Um, so usury was. Uh, was completely forbidden. Well, it was defined as basically just the simple taking of interest on a loan. Um, in, in the first um, half of the church's existence, uh, taking interest interest on a loan was completely forbidden. Uh, so this, so the three principles 
um, of determining the morality of an act uh, are looking at its object, its intention, and the circumstances. Uh, so the object in our example is, um, is, the object is just the act itself. And in our example, it's the taking of interest on a loan. Um, some objects are uh, intrinsically evil, like abortion, for example. It's, it's never um, permitted to, to take the life of an innocent child uh, in the womb. Uh, but there's, you know, most of the things that we do in life are not, not intrinsically evil. There's something uh, that can, can go either way. And so once we determine whether the object is good in itself or not, um, we look at the intention or the end uh, for which the act is performed. Um, if your intention is is wrong, is bad, then it makes the the action um, makes the action wrong. So in our example of usury, uh, if your intention is greed, if you're just out for the, uh, if you just have money as your whole goal in life is to accumulate as much wealth as you want as you can, um, then it make that would make the taking of interest on a loan um, immoral. Uh, and thirdly, but if you don't have that wrong intention, you would look at the circumstances, or at least this is what St. Antoninus did. So in his day, usury was forbidden, um, but he and his summa moralis made a case for why it should, uh, why taking of interest on a loan is not wrong in all cases. Uh, so he, he did this by arguing from circumstances. Uh, so before St. Antoninus' time, money was uh, used only as coin, and not as capital. Uh, so it was used basically, it was just one level up from, from bartering, you know, just an even exchange of goods. Uh, but it wasn't used as capital, it was like it wasn't invested um, in order to increase something's value. Uh, coin was considered to be unproductive, that is, it wasn't money itself that produced more value, it was the, the labor of somebody and what they did with the money. Um, and so if, if somebody were to make a loan and then uh, demand interest on it, it was viewed as uh, basically as stealing because you're taking, you're taxing the labor of somebody else. You aren't um, putting your own work into it. Somebody else is putting the work in and then you were taking the, the money that they made. Uh, but St. Antoninus argued that money had changed and it had become capital so people could invest it uh, and increase the value of their money through, um, through the economic cycle. Um, and so he said that a certain amount of interest on, on a loan was permissible. Um, and this is because he, was, he looked at it, instead of looking at it from the, the aspect of the borrower, he looked at it from the lender's viewpoint. Uh, and when the lender, at that time, when, when money came to be capital, when the lender made a loan, um, he lost the ability to invest that money for himself and to earn his own profit. Uh, so it was viewed as just to ask a moderate interest. Um, because he, he, he had given up his ability to, to make his own money. Um, and so that, that, that's the end of our talk.